Okay, friends, this is attempt number two of my video about trig subs. Important lesson I have learned is if you're engaging your iPad to your uh, Mac through cables, you can't have them hanging off of any edges because if they move even slightly. Okay, so as I say, trig subs. Uh, and this is easier seen than said, and it's not necessarily very easily seen. Haha. -ha. So your trig substitutions are usually your last resort when you're trying to integrate something that has a square root in it and something squared and being added inside the square root. Okay. So basically, these are based on your Pythagorean identities from trigonometry. Cosine squared theta plus sine squared equals one, or one plus tan squared is equal to secant squared. The second one is gotten from the first one by dividing by cosine squared. You can also get another one by dividing by sine squared and having cotangent squared plus one equals cosecant squared but we're gonna concentrate on just these two, all right? So uh, when you take a look at this, if you've got stuff under your square root that looks kind of like a, a number minus a square of, right now it's gonna be x all the time, but later it can be things like x plus one or two times x or something like that, all right? So when that happens, then that tells you to choose your u to be a sine theta. Then if you work out the algebra of it, then the square root stuff, there'll be stuff under the square root, okay? But that square root stuff will work out to be a times the cosine of theta. And then the derivative of your u will turn out to be a cosine theta d theta. And likewise, if you've got something that looks like x squared plus a number under a square root, you can make it work out by letting the u be equal to, or the x be equal to, a times the tangent of theta. The square root turns out to be a secant theta, and then the derivative is a secant squared theta. So the thing that you need to remember on these is that you are taking a function that you're substituting in there for your x, and the square root is always going to give you that companion function that comes from the Pythagorean identity that goes with it, All right? So then, I'm a very visual person. I often say I'm a profoundly visual person. So the way I remember this is to draw a picture. And the picture that I'm drawing here, um, I have a triangle, a right triangle in each case here. So in this case, for the u equals <coughs> sine, a times sine theta, if you were to divide that out, of course you'd get that the sine theta is u over a, or put another way, that the theta would have to then be the inverse sine of u over a. Same thing on the other two, that you could get your uh, theta being the inverse tangent of u over a, or that you could get it being the inverse secant of u over a. Now, nobody ever does inverse secant of anything. They always change it into inverse cosine. What's it the inverse cosine of? Well, it's got to be the reciprocal of what you want to take the inverse secant of. So you put the a over the u. Boom. Done. Okay. So <clears throat> those three bits there, um, <clears throat> for the three different forms that you might have to do trig subs in are what you have to remember. Your immediate question is, do I have to memorize this? No. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be kind of like a YouTuber here who says, I'll put it in the comments. I will put a copy of the chart that I just put there, that I just put in front of y'all, um, uh, somewhere where the links are readily available along with this video. Okay. All right. So if you're doing that, then we need to see some examples. Uh, and the first example is going to be one that falls into that uh, sine type form. See how our square root here has this 9 minus x squared in it? So that's going to tell us that we need to be doing a, a trig sub that has to do with the sine function. Okay. <clears throat> now, if you're looking at it and saying, hey, you know what, I think I could do this anyway. Um, I don't know another way to do these trig sub problems without doing trig subs, unless it's a super special form that basically gets rid of the square root. You know? So <clears throat> again, these are a little bit painful, but we'll get through them. So since it had the nine minus x squared, the square root of nine is three. So we let our x be three sine theta. The derivative of it would give us three cosine theta d theta. And then the square root part of it turns out to be just three cosine theta. Okay. Now, go to your integral and replace each piece one by one. So here, the dx is three cosine theta, uh, d theta, so we just write that down. dx is three sine theta, so x squared becomes nine sine squared theta. And that square root business is supposed to be three cosine theta, so we just have three cosine theta down there, okay? Now, cancel anything that you can cancel. Uh, there's no way that the d theta goes away. It should always end up in there. If you end up with a d theta in your denominator, you just did something wrong with copying it down. But, <clears throat> but in any case, though, you've got something here where one ninth comes out to the front. And with that one ninth coming out to the front, the stuff that's left is one over sine squared, which is going to be cosecant squared. And because you have to integrate it, that was super nice because cosecant squared is one of the forms that we allegedly have memorized. And it turns out to just be negative cotangent theta. So we end up with a negative one ninth cotangent theta. But wait, there's more. You can't just stop there because our original equation was in terms of x. So if you're doing a an indefinite integral, you have to convert it back. Definite integrals are different. All right. So uh, we've got to we've got to convert that back, and so we draw our little triangle here because x was equal to three sine theta, then sine theta is x over three. That means the opposite side needs to be x, and the I'm sorry the hypotenuse needs to be three. So then we use the Pythagorean theorem and say the side that remains has to be the square root of nine minus x squared. And then we go back here and say, what is cotangent? Well, cotangent is adjacent over opposite. So that means that you'll get the square root uh, that's the on the adjacent side and divided by the x. And then other than maybe simplifying a little bit, you're done. So we get it, get it down to the end there. All right? Does that sound okay? I dumbly enough, I'm waiting for feedback from, from you watching this video in the future. So, sorry. <clears throat> um, with, regard, with regard to this, you will get ones that are more complicated than this. And I realize this one felt pretty cumbersome. But 
it's, it's kind of a gentle introduction, relatively speaking. I am not being encouraging, am I? Okay, so let's take a look at another one here. And this one, uh, when it comes up there, you'll see is a definite integral. So I tried to rig this up so it would be not horrifying to actually do the definite integral substitution for, but, but also so it would have several pieces. Notice right here, we didn't have x squared plus one. We instead had three x squared plus one. So the one is gonna be my a, or I guess you could say the square root of one, which is one, is gonna be my a. And the um, three x squared, that has to be u squared. So that means my u has to be square root of three times the x, and I'm going to set that equal to my tangent, right? So that means that the square root business, notice I'm not making you work through all the, the painful business of that stuff. You just have to remember that the square root business will turn out to be your, your partner function here, and you'll get the secant, right? If it had said two times tangent theta, then you'd have two times secant theta, but it just said one tangent theta, so we just have one secant theta. And likewise, when we do our du here, then we'll end up with square root of three dx, which does mean that when we substitute for dx, we're gonna to have to solve for it. But uh, square root of three dx is gonna be the secant squared, right? So now, um, as we're going along here, since we have a definite integral, we're gonna have to figure out what to change those limits to. If you are a masochist and absolutely insist that you could never do this change, sorry, I'm sounding sarcastic because every Calc 2 class I've ever had, about a third of the class just refuses to do this little trick here that just saves you a little bit of effort, okay? You're just gonna change your limits by plugging x equals zero into that, that thing that we had before. It had square root of three times zero is tangent theta. So the theta we want is gonna be zero. And then when x is equal to one, if you plug that in, ah, if you plug that in, then you end up with square root of three is equal to tangent theta. And the theta that goes with that is pi over three. So, and now we do the substituting in. Our dx turns into secant squared theta d theta over square root of three. Our square root there at the bottom just turns into secant theta. Our limit of zero turned into zero, and our limit of one turned into pi over three, okay? So simplifying that out, we have over here our one over the pi, one over the square root of three from factoring it out, and we will have canceled out one of our secants from the top with the secant on the bottom. So now we just have to integrate secant theta d theta. Now, if you don't remember integral of secant theta d theta, don't worry, just go look it up. But it comes up enough that you probably ought to put it on a formula sheet, okay? So uh, then we end up with log absolute value secant theta plus tangent theta. And then you just have to, from there, plug in. So we plug in the pi over three, and we plug in the zero. The secant of pi over three, well, the cosine of pi over three is one half, so the secant will be two. The tangent of uh, pi over three uh, turns out to be the square root of three. So we end up here with the one third logarithm two plus square root of three. And then, uh, Plugging in the zero, the secant of zero is one, the tangent of zero is zero, 
So that means we have one over root three times the log of one, but the log of one is zero. So that part just goes away, okay? And so at the end of it, we end up with uh, the logarithm of absolute value of two plus root three all over root three. And that's that. If you insist that you have to do the substitution back in because I, you've been a bad person and deserve to be punished or something, uh, you can insert like three or four extra lines in that. Uh, try not to get the calculations wrong because that's, I get calculations wrong all the time. That's the reason why I try to avoid having to do that, so. All right, so we've done one with the sine, we've done one with the tangent, now we need to do one with the secant in order to kind of complete the set. Um, personally, I tend to find the ones with the secant in them are always a little bit of a pain. And this will be no exception. All right, so this time around, we have a square root that has the x squared minus two. If it had said two minus x squared, we'd be doing a sine. If it had said x squared plus two, we'd be doing tangent, but it says x squared minus two. So that means we're doing a secant. So that means that our x will have to be square root of two times the secant of theta. And when you work it out, the square root part then will turn out to be this radical two tangent theta. And when you take the derivative, you end up with this messy square root two secant theta tangent theta d theta, okay? So, plugging all that back in over here, you end up with the top, that square root stuff being root two tangent theta, and you end up with the dx being square root two secant theta tangent theta, and that bottom that was just x is the square root two secant theta. Now, a little bit of a mess here is it was a definite integral, and we're going to plug in the x equals two to see what the theta limit will be. Well, if you've got that, then that means that you have two equals root two secant theta solving. That gives you secant theta is root two. Well, that means that the cosine of the theta would have been one over root two. And so that means we're talking about a pi over four, okay? Now, the ugly one is if you have something that's not gonna cancel out, it's not gonna be a special angle, you will end up coming down to something horrifying like this. I've got my theta equals inverse cosine of root two over three. But it's not nice. So you don't want to write that over and over again. So instead of writing it over and over again, I will give it a name beta that I can write over and over again without miscopying it and without mistaking it for another variable. And that's just what I'll refer to it as until I need it. So coming back here, my lower limit is the pi over four and the upper limit is that beta, right? And then we go through and do our cancellation. We can see one of the radical twos cancels with the other one. One of the secants cancels with the other one. We're left with a radical two coming out to the front. And there are two uh, factors of tangent left over. So we have an integral of tangent squared, which you look at and you say, oh man, <clears throat> if I had a secant squared, I know what to do. Well, fortunately, you can take your tangent squares down to the trigonometry exchange shop and turn them in and get a perfectly good secant squared minus one, barely used, owned by a little old lady from Pasadena when we drove it on Sundays. Ha ha. Anyhow, you can trade that tan squared in for secant squared minus one because of the trig identity. Then when you want to integrate that, the integral of secant squared is just tangent and the integral of one is just theta, okay? So those will be a little bit of a mess when we get later on in it, but it's not too bad for now. 
So if you plug in your beta, then you have a tangent of an inverse cosine of square root of two over three. Yuck. But if you draw your little right triangle here, if the cosine, if the cosine was square root of two over three, then you put square root of two in the adjacent side here and the three on the hypotenuse there, okay? And then the Pythagorean theorem tells you that you end up with a square root of seven on the one remaining side, okay? So once you have that, then you're gonna be able to plug in here and just have the value. The inverse cosine of square root of two over three though, it just has to remain the inverse cosine of square root of two over three. We can't simplify it, okay? But uh, we can on the other part when plugging in the pi over four, say tangent of pi over four is one, and the pi over four of pi over four is pi over four. So we end up with a pretty messy looking thing here for our final answer. But if you were doing this for the purpose of uh, some rocket science or something, you would go ahead and plug that in the calculator there at the end and get that it's about 0.8150, okay? So, the looking back at this, the main difficulty with it was in this part over here, right? While you were uh, while you were trying to plug in and get your x values, it just got messy. But we can hypothetically on these uh, have ones that we need to do some of that messy work on. So. I feel like we ought to see one or two of them. All right. Okay, so um, that gets us three examples, but now I wanna do one more example because there's something that comes up in trig subs that uh, it's not the trig sub and it's just an extraneous piece that makes things difficult. Okay, so what I'm talking about is completing the square. So it's better to see this in an example than to just have me talk about it. So here's our fourth example here. So see how that square root has 2x minus x squared in it? So you know you've got a minus x squared. You know this has something to do with one of those sine squared things. But you are way too smart to think that the 2x is gonna somehow be the a squared. You know that can't be right because a squared has to be a constant. So you come over here and set your 2x minus x squared out, right? And you say, okay, if I took the minus one out of that, then I would have a minus of x squared minus 2x. The reason you were taking that out is so that then you could put a plus one in there to complete the square. Why one? Well, because you took this minus two, half of that is, is minus one, square it and you get one. That's how you complete a square, right? So you added one inside the parentheses, which means you actually subtracted one because that one has a minus hanging on to it. So in order to balance that out, so you didn't actually change the equation, you are going to add one here to balance this one that you added inside of a negative there, okay? So this turns into one, so that's your a squared, minus the x plus one squared. I copied that one wrong. So let me fix that one real quick here. That should say, x minus one squared, oof. All right, so once you know that bit, then we've got to do little bits of tidying up as we go along. Our u is gonna be the x minus one, and so you set x minus one equal to sine theta. 
later, it'll be important to be able to solve and say that the x then is sine theta minus one. But when you take and work out that square root business, it's gonna turn out to be just cosine theta. And when you take the derivative of x minus one, of course the minus one disappears. And so you have just the dx and just the sine theta, okay? So now we have to substitute back in. Our x that was gonna be squared is gonna be sine theta minus one, you say quantity squared. Our square root is gonna be just that cosine theta. And I probably ought to leave that off for now. And then the dx is going to be this cosine theta d theta, all right? And so we'll get cancellation between these two, and we'll have to deal with just the sine theta minus one quantity squared. So going ahead and, ex and expanding and squaring that out there, we end up with a sine squared minus two sine theta plus one. Sine squared, hopefully you'll remember from the other video about trigonometric integrals, we rewrite as one minus cosine two theta over two, okay? And then if we take the one half that happens there and the one here, we can put them together and have this three halves. And then we'll have a minus of that, oh shoot, God, folks, I missed, that needed to be plus, that needed to be plus, that needed to be plus, that needs to be plus, that needs to be plus. Okay, so we'll have the minus cosine two theta and then the plus sine two theta. Then when you integrate that, the integral of a cosine is a sign and you don't change the SIGNs on that. But when you integrate the sign, eh, um, you get a negative cosine, right? Right, yeah. So weirdly, when I wrote these down earlier, I seem to have made two mistakes that canceled out. All right. Anyway, though, your integral, of course, has the ever popular C at the end of it. And then it's really just a matter of trading back for your X's. So uh, your, um, your three halves theta, we can't do anything to help that out. It is just going to end up with an inverse sine in it. But your sine two theta, we have to expand it out because we can solve for cosine theta and we can solve for sine theta, but we can't solve for sine two theta out of this, out of this diagram. So when you're doing this, you have to remember sine two theta is actually two sine theta cosine theta. And then you have the one fourth. And so when you multiply together, you will end up with a one half of sine theta cosine theta. Now, sine theta, you know, is just the x plus one. Is it the x plus one? No, it's the x minus one. And the cosine theta is gonna be at square root jazz, right? And the minus two cosine theta is minus two times that square root jazz. And of course, for your inverse sine portion of it, it's supposed to be the inverse sine since, uh, since sine is, sine theta is x minus one, then theta is gonna be uh, your inverse sine of x minus one, okay? So your final result that you get here is very messy. All of your answers for uh, trig subs always end up being super messy. I'm sorry. Wish it were otherwise, but that's how those work. Uh, so that should give you kind of a basic exposure. The complete the square stuff is not really trigonometry. 
but all the rest of it is knowing those uh, trigonometric identities that have the cosine squared and the sine squared is being equal to one and, and the others that are derivative from that. Okay, so hopefully this helps out a little bit and I'll get this posted. By the time you see this, it will be posted. Ha. Huh. Yeah.